everyone, this is Amanda Moore from the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, and you're listening to the ASF Podcast, the show that explains everything you want to know about Angelman Syndrome. We're so excited you're here, and we hope you enjoy the show. Well, welcome to another episode of the Angelman Syndrome Podcast. I am super excited about tonight's podcast. We often get so many questions about the different genotypes and how they present in our loved ones with Angelman Syndrome. So I thought the best thing we could do was go to the source. And so I have some amazing individuals on the line with me tonight that all have different types of genotypes in Angelman syndrome. And we're just going to have a conversation about what that means for them and their family and for their loved one with Angelman syndrome. So we're going to jump right in because we have a lot to cover tonight and a lot to talk about. So my first question for my guest, I'm going to ask first that you introduce yourself to everyone. And so uh, if you could introduce yourself and then ask the question or answer the question, Um, which specific genotype um, that your child has and how it affects the symptoms in the development of your loved one with Angelman syndrome. So we're going to start off with my friend, Julie. So don't forget to introduce yourself and then we'll go from there. So Julie. I'm Julie Staub and my son, Gavin is 12 and a half years old and he has the impermeant center defect type of Angelman syndrome. And um, he was diagnosed with Angelman syndrome at two and a half. And, um, with imprint gene center defect type, um, we, Gavin's struggles a lot with anxiety, um, that started presenting itself really bad around three, three and a half. Um, it was so bad. Like we couldn't even go in a restaurant. Um, and it is still, he struggles with it still on a daily basis, um, because he completely understands the world around him and, understands everything going on around him, but he can't verbally speak. Mm. Um, and he has a lot of signs, um, and gestures that are his favorite things to do. Um, and he is not afraid to communicate with anybody. And as long as people watch him and try to understand him, they can usually understand him. Um, I kind of described it as playing charades all day with him. Um, he does have a AAC device, but he doesn't, he prefers not to use it. Um, he'd rather use his gestures and signs. Um, sleep has also always been an issue for him. Um, that really started presenting itself basically since he was born. Um, and then it peaked where it was really bad around two, two and a half. He would be up at 3am for the day. And, um, no, I guess it was two, sorry. It was like two, two and a half right after he was diagnosed. Um, and that has mountains and valleys. It comes and goes. Some nights are better than others. Um, and he does take medication for sleep and he also takes medication for anxiety because I'm very confident without those, it would be an absolute train wreck every day Mm -hmm. for him. Um, seizures for Gavin are thankfully not a big issue. Um, he's only had four seizures in his whole life. Um, which I'm very thankful about his first one was when he was like three and a half. And it was definitely anxiety driven on an airplane. Oh. Um, definitely not the place you want to have your first seizure experience. Um, and then his last three have been with sickness. So now we're just on seizure alert when he pops a fever. So um, his last one was actually a couple months ago uh, when he was sick. So um Thankfully, seizures are not a big issue for us. Um, He is also able to get around very well. Um, Gross motor skills are are very strong for him. Um, He walked at 18 months on his own. He can ride a regular bike with like adult training wheels. Um, He can run, he can jump, he can climb on a playground. Um, it's, It's a blessing, but it's also very challenging because people can't see his disability, um, which is great because people can't judge him. But then when he does something that's maybe a little more out of the ordinary and then he can't talk, then, you know, people kind of figure out that something's going on. Um, but that's, that's kind of the big things with, um, imprinting center that, um, 
would say right now. Now, Julie, like, is, is he on any specific seizure medication or is he just on the medication for anxiety and sleep? Um, he's not on any seizure medication. Okay. He's on a seizure medication. We do have a proactive plan that when he gets a fever, he gets Valium when okay. he has her to cover him for seizure coverage. Um, Gavin, when he um, is very anxious, he will gag and sometimes throw up. But when he gets sick with like anything, he starts throwing up and can't stop because he has mm. kind of like an overactive gag reflux. So we yeah. always end up in the ER and because we need Zofran in the IV. So uh, when he's sick, any type of thing, we give him Valium just for that seizure covered. It doesn't, we, he still has had him. Yeah. But oh. Well, so, the, I mean, I, I think the research is pretty updated, but I think it, it's important for the community to know when we talk about the different genotypes, what percent of the community that we know of has, you know, this, the, these different genotypes. And the research shows us it's about, for yours, it's about 6% of the community. So definitely a smaller portion. But I'm sure that everyone that's listening right now that has an uh, individual with Angelman syndrome with the same genotype is probably nodding their heads as well. Um, and we'll get a little bit more deeper into some of the things that you talked about um, after we um, hear from, let's go next to our friend, Leah. And if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your loved one with angel and syndrome and their genotype. Yeah. Um, so I'm Leah Scott. We live in the Kansas city area. Um, and my son, Caden is five and a half. He was adopted at birth and we started noticing that he wasn't hitting milestones between like six and nine months old. Um, we would take him to the doctor and the doctor would say, well, every baby is different. Every mm -hmm. baby develops differently. You shouldn't be worried. We'll, we'll check it again later. We'll check it again later. And so every time it was, we'll check it again later. And at 18 months, he still wasn't walking. Um, and so then, then they were like, oh, is he babbling? No. Um, so no walking, no babbling. Um, finally, they sent us straight to the geneticist because they couldn't test myself or my husband because he was adopted. Mm. So um, it was a battle to get in with the geneticist. And we finally um, got in. I <laughs> pushed my way in. Um, I wasn't going to wait however long they wanted me to wait. I was like this this is not getting better and we need answers now because we could be doing something about it. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I'm just sitting on my hands waiting for someone to tell me bad news. Um, so we finally got in, it was still a couple month wait after we originally saw the geneticist. And um, in that time frame, though, um, two days before Christmas and about two weeks before his birthday, he started walking. And I mean, it was just tears, you know, mm -hmm. tears of joy. Um, but then at the end of January, um, we got the call that said he had, um, Angelman syndrome, but then the geneticist said, but it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> and I was like, what, <laughs> what does that even mean? Um, she said, well, it's, it's mosaic Angelman syndrome. So of course I Google it. Um, and you could find, could find very little, mm -hmm. um, about it, um, and she really didn't have very much information for us either. Both of us just thought, okay, well, you've given us this diagnosis and then sent us away. And what are we supposed to do? Um, so it was also about six weeks before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. um, I immersed myself in all of the online community that I could find. Um, but I mean, we were just alone. Yeah. Um, we finally got a, uh, an appointment with Dr. Dewis. She was the first specialist that um, saw us. And it was the first time I really felt like, okay, someone gets this kid. Mm. Um, because I, I think people thought we were also maybe exaggerating Caden's symptoms because we also, <laughs> six months after Caden was born, had a surprise baby. Um, and so our children are only six and a half months apart. So I think a lot of the times people thought we were talking about how Caden never slept in sort of an exaggerated way because mm. they thought we just were suffering from serious sleep deprivation with two new babies. But I'm not kidding when I tell you he never slept and mm. we were in his room all night long and then trying to feed this other baby. It was awful. Um, so mm. 
one of the first things we did was, uh, was ask about sleep and we've been through all kinds of sleep medication. Um, got a safe, a safety bed last year, um, which has been a huge blessing. Although I did catch him climbing it on uh, last Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess that's one of the things about mosaicism is that Caden, um, like Gavin has really great motor skills. Um, Caden is enrolled in an excessive, um, and, dance class. Um, and they just had their, um, dance recital about a month ago. He loves it. Um, Played softball this season. He loves it. He loves to play basketball. If he's going to aim a ball, he will be me with it. Cause he, he's just got great aim. Um, and he just loves being active, but also like Gavin, he doesn't speak. Um, he has lots of signs. He loves to sign. You teach him once and he knows it. Wow. Um, and then he also has his own signs, which we call, you know, Caden signs. Yeah. Um, <sighs> he also has an AAC, but he really doesn't choose to use it unless he is just overwhelmingly frustrated with you, but it takes him a long time. He will sign over and over and over again and like really look you in the eye. Like you've got it right. You're getting it right. So, um, I mean, he, he will make you understand one way or the other. Um, another thing, another piece about mosaicism and that was very similar to what Julie was talking about is that anxiety for Caden is off mm. the chart. And we have cycled through so many anxiety and behavior medications in this poor little person's short little life, um, trying to make him feel comfortable in his own skin. Mm. Um Today, when I dropped him off at school, he saw the teacher he loves and just started wailing. And it wasn't, he was, he was happy and, and upset all at the same time. Mm. Um, And this happens daily. It happens when we go to Sunday school. It happens when we see my parents and people he loves. Um, He's terrified of bugs and also fascinated by them. So he'll like scream the whole time he's going up to one and then want to touch it and then scream again. Mm. Um, So, and, and another thing that I just identify with, I was over here shaking my head, Julie, I was just nodding. Yes. Yes. When you're talking about how there's such a blessing that people look at him and they just go, what a beautiful little boy. Um, And there's not a visible something, you know, obvious to most people. Um, But that almost makes it harder because Mm -hmm. then they look at you like you're a really terrible parent when all Mm -hmm. these things start happening in these behaviors. So um, for Mm -hmm. us, just to find this community was great because nobody knows, um, nobody I knew knew what Angelman syndrome was. And then nobody knew what mosaic Angelman syndrome was either, which if you don't know, mosaicism means that only some of your cells have Angelman syndrome. Some of them are neurotypical. Um, and I believe I'm getting that terminology correct with Caden. They say it's about, um, one in 20 is neurotypical. So he has about 5% of his cells that have UBE 3A. Um, and those cells are working real hard. So, Mm. (laughs) um, he's incredible and we just continue to champion every inch stone because they're all huge. Um, and and are excited for things to come down the pipeline that will hopefully affect him in a really positive way soon. Yeah, I was just looking at it's this incredibly small percentage of our of our individuals with Angelman who've been diagnosed with that. And I think there's probably a lot to learn still um, um, about each genotype, but especially that one. And so I was just reading a little bit about it as well, because I mean, obviously, um, I know a little bit about each one of them, but I also think, you know, with our loved ones with the Angelman syndrome, no matter what genotype they have it there, I think all of our kids are so diverse in the way they present, right? Whether you're, you know, mosaicism or deletion, they're still like, it's hard to say you're going to fit under this umbrella of this genotype because they always tend to surprise us. Right. Well, thank you for sharing. I think that, um, I know I learned something um, from you f- during this. And I'm once again, sure, people who are listening who um, have the same genotype are shaking their heads as well. So I'm going to move over to Courtney. Courtney would love to hear more about your story. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, Julie, Leah, listening to your stories, very similar. Um, our son, Aaron, I just was doing the math. He's going to be seven in two months, which is just blowing my mind. Right? So he's almost seven. 
Um, he has UPD or uniparental disomy, which means he has um, two of the dad copies on his 15th chromosome rather than having a deletion on one of them. So um, very overachieving father, I guess. You can say. <laughs> um, but uh, Leah, similar, similar to your story, we, it was the, so my, um, we had an 18 month old son when Aaron came along and so it was like that, you know, you're just kind of exhausted and you've got a baby. And so when we would go to the doctor, we we're just like, oh yeah, reflux, not sleeping, second child, probably on the floor a lot more or whatever, right? Just like, they'll grow out of it. But I'll never forget at our nine month doctor appointment, we saw a new doctor in our practice who was new. And, um, and she said, has he babbled at all? And I looked at Joey, my husband, and I was like, I don't, think so you know when the kids would like blow spit bubbles and stuff like I was like he's never done that lots of glottal sounds right like definitely vocal no babbling so she's like well let's just keep an eye on it and then at 12 months he still wasn't speaking at all so they we started in speech therapy um with uh with a provider but they also recommended we see a developmental pediatrician. And I was so thankful for that because I, you know, I remember talking to Erin's preschool teacher at the time and she's like, there's, you know, it's easy to just kind of be like, oh, they'll grow out of it. They'll grow out of it. But I felt like our care team, thankfully, was like, let's, let's get on this path. Um, so we saw a developmental pediatrician. They did the swab test. Um, and so it came back. And it was said it was either Prater Willie or it was Angelman because he had UPD. And so we then had to go for a blood test, but there was like weeks between where we were researching Prater Willie, we were researching Angel Men, and we're like, which one, you know, like, you know, it's not really like you hope for one or the other, just kind of in limbo. And then we got the blood test back. And you know what? It's funny, Amanda, like when I think about and hear other stories, like, I don't think we ever got a phone call. I think it was like, hey, your results are available. Um, which but, is the worst, right? Like when you get a diagnosis I mean, like this, like you don't want to, you don't want to hear, go to your, my chart and read about it. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and I, you know, no fault to anybody, but I was like, you know, it was just interesting. So we get this and we're like, what, you know, like angel man syndrome. So anyway, he was diagnosed when he was 18 months. Um, but like, it was interesting because he did not have seizures, you know, as a baby, he sat up and crawled like pretty, you know, maybe late, but not super late. It was mainly the talking. And then he didn't walk until he was two and a half. So it felt like once he hit one, you started to see like the difference in his development as opposed to other children's. Um, and so fast forward now that he's almost seven, very similar to both of your kiddos, like seizures didn't start until five, thankfully. Um, he had some abs on seizures and then had a really long one at school. It's like 11 minutes long. So he is on seizure medicine now. Um, and we also are on Risperdone, which helps both behaviors and sleep for us. And, you know, anxiety is really, it's hard because he, like, we went over to a friend's house today and it was a new house and it's just like overwhelming, doesn't know how to contain his body. Um, very active, very mobile, doesn't always know how to communicate properly. So, um, but you know, the good news is he wants to get in there and play with other kids. So yeah, every day is a journey. Absolutely. And I think what I read was for your, for that genotype, it's about 3% of the population. So I'm Morgan and I have Annabelle and Bellamy. Annabelle's five and Bellamy is about to be three. Wow. And they have uh, it, mutations. So it's actually the form that was inherited from me and not the random mutation. So with that being, it's a 50% chance for me to pass it to my kids. And that's why both of them have Angelman syndrome. That's, that's so interesting, right? You have, tw you have two kids with Angelman syndrome yes. mutation. <laughs> so when you got that diagnosis, I'm just curious... Um, the first diagnosis, how was that, that process for you to get that diagnosis? Well, at first we got Annabelle's diagnosis and I was just like, you know, of course I was in denial and then I was like, what can we do to fix this? But then finding out that where, you know, research is and stuff right now, we're not fixing it. We're just treating it. 
Yeah. And so then I was, they were like, Oh, what about your son asking me what Bellamy like symptoms he might have or characteristics? And I'm like, Oh no, he doesn't have that. He cries and and about it and cry and he has this and he does this. But then they were like, well, let's test just to make sure because it is inherited from you for Annabelle. And once we did that and his test came back positive, I was just like, I mean, honestly, I was in utter shock. Yeah. I mean, how would you not be? And then like, we've always wanted to have like a big family and then it becomes questionable of what does my future hold, you know? I mean, yeah. And giving them the best life and then having to bring kids in it. It's a, you know, got to look out for them as well. So I'm curious when you, when you found out about Bellamy, like, did you do, did you, did the doctors have you do any sort of genetic testing yourself? Yes. So whenever they tested Annabelle, they as well tested me and my husband. And so at that time they knew that it was inherited from me. So they're like, let's test Bellamy and just get it out of the way. And he was only like five months old at the time. And so he wasn't showing too much other than like just a little bit of development and mobility and reflux and constipation. But at that time, I was so new to the diagnosis. I didn't have any idea that those were characteristics. Sure. Sure. The other one I want to mention, obviously, is the deletion positive, which is typically the larger percentage. I think it's about 70 percent of the community um, is deletion. And that is what my sweet Jackson has. And I think that most people probably know a lot of the different symptoms because it's, it tends to be what we talk about the most because it's the one that, you know, um, is, is the largest in our, our, um, largest percentage wise, but Jackson, you know, very, very early on, obviously Leah, the sleep thing, but we kept, everyone kept telling us it was because we had twins and, you know, it was typical. And I thought I was going to smack the next person that said that it's typical for twins never to, you know, sleep. And I'm like, okay, I'm literally going to smack you. I don't even remember those times. Like there were, my husband and I had like a pact that anything that was said to each other between like one and five was immediately forgiven after 5 a.m. Because we were just such zombies at that point because the sleep was really bad. Um, his eating, his, um, he, the first thing he presented was his sucking, like he couldn't swallow. So we had to feed him differently. We had to turn him on his side and feed him like this. It was very interesting. Um, and then it was, uh, you know, we started noticing all of, you know, the delays because he had a carbon copy of him right next to him. So we started going to all the doctors, sent us to an eye doctor, found out he needed glasses, send us to a hearing doctor, his hearing's fine you know, heart doctor, heart's fine. They did even an MRI EEG, nothing came back. And then uh, I think it was about 18 months or maybe two, I don't, Adam and I go back and forth on this. It was around 18 months when he had his first seizure. We didn't know he was having a seizure. We literally thought he was just off balance and he had an ear infection. So I rushed him to urgent care because he was having ear infections constantly and the urgent care doctor walked in and took one look at him and said, your child just had a seizure. And I was like, huh? <laughs> Cause I'd never, I mean, when you're, when you're not introduced to this stuff at ever any point in your life outside of like a grand mal seizure, right? You just don't know. So that kind of started our journey um, with Angelman, but typical for us is, you know, the seizures are controlled by medication, but I think for us, they're, you know, like even today, he, something's going on and he's having seizure activity. And so I think the longer you like it, I hate to say it becomes desensitized because he had a seizure, but we have a plan and we know what to do. And I think, especially if you're newly diagnosed and listening, that's like the key, right? Like Julie said, we have a plan. If it happens, we have a plan. Um, And so, you know, the seizures are really hard, non, you know, nonverbal working really, really hard on his communication device, but just, just will not, will not perform. He just does not want to perform on that, on that device. Um, still has a little issues with sleeping, but not too bad. Um, we do, um, have trazodone that we use, but usually when we travel, because when we travel, he's terrible at sleeping. And then, it, cause I think it has a lot to do also with his anxiety and behavior. So I think there's some similar threads, right. Throughout all the genotypes, but I'm curious, from your perspective, and we're going to get into some questions here. Um, 
we've talked a little bit already about like uh, how you first learned about your child's genotype and what challenges and unique characteristics. Um, but I, I'm curious for anyone who's listening who has an individual with this genotype, in terms of like medical management and interventions, have you found any genotype specific approaches or strategies that have been particularly effective for you and your loved one with Angelman syndrome? And anyone can jump in. I was going to say, I, yeah. I can go. Yeah. I would, for us, um, the, the sleep portion is pretty well controlled at the moment. We, um, you know, we have a safety bed and I mean, it's like the grand poobah of safety beds, you know, with the big wooden bed that goes all the way to the top. I mean, it, it, it looks like I can't, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but it looks like like an old timey circus cart that you put an animal in, you know, I mean, it looks like a little wooden cage and people, when they first saw that were like, you put your child in that. And I was like, well, the alternative is to have him run around my house all night. So yeah. yes, I do. Um, you know, we've combined that though with clonidine and he's on Seroquel and he's got terrible allergies. So at night he gets Benadryl. And I mean, like he's, he's doped up. I mean, there's just no other way to say it, but also with his anxiety and behavior, because the anxiety comes out as just physical aggression to the nth degree, um, biting, hitting, hitting, kicking, scratching, punching, mm -hmm. you know, pinching all of all the things. Um, and so we've had him in ABA therapy for about two years. Okay, It's been the best thing. I would 1 million percent recommend it to anybody. Um, our clinic, though, is a fully immersive clinic that does ABA, OT, PT, and speech all in the same setting. And it's like an immersive preschool setting. Mm. Um, so that's been a tremendous blessing. I don't know where we would be without those therapists, but in particular, that that ABA portion of it. And I know people have a lot of feelings about ABA. It can be sure. very divisive. Um but for our family, that's been huge. Sure. Well, and I think, you know, once again, when it comes to all of our different journeys, we all have different ways that we approach it. And it's, you know, we have to respect that that's the decisions that made a family. I know there is a lot of conversation around ABA. Um, it's probably, probably maybe left to another podcast um, episode, but I'm, you know, it sounds like it's working tremendously for your family. And if that's what works and that's what works, right? Right. Right. So, so um, it, Julie or Courtney, anything specific that has worked for you, Julie? Okay. I'm Julie. I have Gavin. He's um, 12 with um, ICD. And um, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can, I would give young, young, Parent, kids with parents with young kids is therapy the heck out of them. Mm -hmm. We, I lived at therapy. Gavin was in therapy starting at 15 months old and he literally went to speech two, three times a week, PT once a week, OT once a week. And by the time he got to kindergarten, we had to scale it down because he couldn't go so often. And we worked our butts off at home as well. Um, but he, I think that definitely helped him um, be able to develop the skills that he could do that he can do now. And he's stronger because of it. I think um, I also Gavin is my middle. I didn't say that before. Um, Gavin has a brother that's two years older and a sister that's two years younger and siblings are the absolute best mm. thing for these kids. Aww. They, um, they teach them so much and they, I, you know, they pull him, they push him, they look up to him. Um, so use the siblings. Um, they, they want to help at least mine do. Um, I wanted to touch too, cause we talked about sleep, um, the bedding a little bit. Mm -hmm. So Gavin is older than Leah and Courtney's kid and Amanda's son. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think there's maybe some, some difference in that, but, um, Gavin, my husband built him a um, safe bed at four because we couldn't use the crib anymore with the mattress on the floor and insurance wasn't approving it. And so my husband built one and we built it in the way that, so that we could eventually take it down, hoping mm -hmm. that someday we wouldn't have to have it like that. 
And that someday came about three, four years ago. Wow. Um, Gavin is actually in a regular double bed with the box spring, the bed. It has like a wooden rail, so he can't roll out, but we lock his door Mm -hmm. so he can't get out. And, um, but so just know that some kids, they're not going to be in that their whole life, but they could be too. Um, but I just want to put that out there that, um, that just don't, don't have any expectations and just keep trying new things because, and just don't have a ceiling on them because, um, when Gavin was diagnosed, we were told he would never write. He would never read. He would never do this. He would never do that. He would never do that. He can write. And we'll probably get to that later. Things he can do that he was ceiling on and we never put a ceiling on him. And, um, so that back to the advice of therapy, your kid as much as you can, because, and then take what they tell you and bring it home. Like as much as you can do when they're younger, I feel like that definitely helped Gavin out as he got older. Awesome. That's great advice. Hey guys, it's Amanda here. As you know, we're here for you, our community. If you have questions about any topics we can discuss in our podcast, or if you have ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. All you need to do is email me at dearamanda at angelman.org. Thank you so much for listening and your continued support of the Angelman Syndrome Foundation. For us, actually, sleep was a disaster when we traveled when he was younger. Now, he sleeps in a blow up bed, like on the floor right next to us. And when we travel, he actually sleeps better because that anxiety piece, he knows he's sleeping right next to us. Like mm. he knows he's right next to us on the floor. So, yeah. Um, he needs to come teach his buddy Jackson um, how to do that because it doesn't matter. I c- we can all be in the bed and he is ready for a party. <laughs> Courtney, what about you? Yeah, there's just so much commonalities. Um, Julie, I think if Aaron was in the bed with us, I know if Aaron was in the bed with us, none of us would sleep uh, ever. He he never calms down. Um, but he just loves, you know, just wrestling and like rolling all over us. But I think so back to your point, Leah, like the safety bed has been huge for us. Um, we tried the, when we took him out of the crib, we tried just putting a mattress on the floor, but it was like his little brain could never calm down in the room and he would just like run around the room all night long all night long um and it was getting worse and worse he was getting more and more overtired so it was harder and harder for him to sleep so we we did the safety bed and he loves it um so I'm so thankful we have that we also I don't know if your children do this but um this like he will take off any clothes that he has on in the safety bed and we have been through y'all have no idea how many different solutions um my husband came up with this brilliant idea a couple of years ago to get a wetsuit for him, like a shorty, short sleeve, short, short wetsuit. And I just sew a clip on the back of it. And so he wears regular PJs and a pull up, but the wetsuit is always on top. And that has been our saving grace because, you know, it was just, it's those little things that are so hard and just another you know like 20 minutes later you put him back in bed and he's naked again he never you know you're just like this is the stuff that drives us crazy and so it's finding those little hacks I think that you know help us get sleep um, so we can all survive also all the therapy we have a like a an all in one like you do Leah and um, it was last summer I was really frustrated because like our school situation for Aaron ended up not working out. And so this past year, he literally just did therapy nine to noon every day. Um, And I think it's just been amazing. You know, looking back on it, I'm almost thankful. You know, it's like you look back and these things happen for a reason, but Mm -hmm. I've seen him grow so much. But now it's like pulling back all of that one-on-one attention that he has to go back into a like small classroom setting. Um, The last thing that I'll say is, for us, um, diet has been really important for behavior. So he's, um, he's allergic to dairy. He can't have like any milk, any yogurt. And if he has cheese, it's like the opposite where it makes him really constipated. So we don't do any dairy. We've also cut out gluten. Um, and we've, we don't do any dyes and very little sugars. And we can tell a huge difference when he either has like a, you know, fruit snacks with dye in it, or huh. if he has um, a lot of gluten. And so 
Um, I mean, I don't know how much it does for seizures, if it does anything, but behavior wise for like anxiety and behavior, we have really seen a lot of um, benefit from diet. And then also magnesium, we just do a magnesium capsule that we pour in his milk and his almond milk at night. Um, that's really helped with sleep and I think his bowel movements. Um, but yeah, I mean that we can tell if he's constipated, then the behavior sure. comes and the sleep comes, right? And so that I would just reinforce like his diet has helped as well. But it's, he's got that Prater Willie like adjacent. So he loves everything. So we don't, have, you know, like he gets very anxious around food and we'll eat. So we don't have issues with him not wanting certain food. So it's easier for us, I think, to cut things out. I, I was funny because when I saw you last at the golf tournament, your child and one of the other um, individuals with, with the angel when that was there was eating anything that the parents put in front of them. And it was all this healthy food. And I'm like, please teach me your ways because li- literally for my, well, for Jackson, the hardest thing is like, he just doesn't care about eating. He's not food motivated. Like I've seen some of the, when it comes to like the communication device, some of the other genotypes are able to use food to motivate them to actually use the communication device. And my child is not food motivated whatsoever. He won't yeah. eat. And right now all he eat is chocolate donuts. And it's like the worst thing ever. And I can't get him to eat anything else. And so I've heard, you know, I'm always one of those moms and I'm like, one of these days I'll do the diet. And it's like one of these days I'll get there. He did have avocado the other day. I was so proud of him. So I think for deletion, it's not, you know, I don't know if it's medical. I mean, I could talk about all the different, you know, medications and that's all out there as far as the medications to control seizures, what we do for constipation, like everything kind of, in my opinion, for at least for Jackson, when it comes to medical interventions, it's all tied together in some ways. So when his behavior or when he's off in some ways, you go through the checklist, which I'm sure you all have. Does he have an earache? Is he constipated? Does he have a headache? Has he, you know, did he hurt his arm or did he fall at school? And we just don't know it. Like all these different things. And when you finally figure it out, you're like, yes, I'm a doctor. It's awesome. Um, And so you go through the litany of things when it comes to it, but he's down to like a really great regimen. He's got seizure medication. He's got melatonin at night. um, And that's kind of what he, he is, you know, that his medical, at least for medications he's on. But what I I don't know if it's medical management or interventions, but a strategy I think probably for all of our kids, but what I've noticed for Jackson is it's not a question of if it's a question of when he's going to get something it, we could, we've tried for like three years to get him to use a straw and he just, you know, wouldn't do it. Not successful or like, it was just every is repetition, repetition, repetition. And then one day finally started drinking out a straw. Does that know where grabbed it? Like he had known how to do it all of his life. Same with walking. It was the same thing. And same with toileting now, like we have been toileting the school and myself and, and, you know, everyone, we have been trying to toilet train this kid for two or three years. He now can go number two, number one, not so great, but like, I, it's all about this repetition. It's it, like Julie said, they worked really, really, really hard. Right. And so even though we're constantly tired, I feel like you just put in that effort and know that like, it's not a question of if it's when, like it, they'll get there and, and you'll continue to work. It could be 10 years from now, but I'm determined that one of these days, Jackson's going to pull out that communication device and tell me that his head hurts because we've been working on it for 10 years. Right. So I think it's all about repetition. And I'm, I'm curious because I, I know we only have a, a, a short amount of time and I, I have a couple more questions I really want to get to, but Julie, you talked a little bit about like, you, you mentioned like there are things that, that Gavin can do that you're really proud of, like reading or writing or whatever. If you could each just share kind of maybe something specific about that, you know, what your child is doing that maybe you were worried they, they weren't, but they're able to do it and kind of what that journey was to get there. Julie, maybe if you want to start since you kind of talked about it. Sure. So, um, when, so right after Gavin was diagnosed, my son Gavin is the 12 year old, um, with ICD. And, um, I went to his OT and I said, okay, they told me he's not going to write. He's going to write and he's going to write one word. We're going to start with his name. When I start with the alphabet, we start with his name. So we started with this five letters of his name. 
And then we just built from there and he can, um, he can write the whole alphabet. He can write, he can, um, and I hope, I hope a lot of parents get some hope out of this, that it's possible. I mean, Mm -hmm. he can write, I, I do learning time with him in the summer too. Um, he does not get summer school. He's going to be in seventh grade this year. Wow. I can write it. I can say a sentence. I see dog. I see the dog. I see the pig can write it on a piece of paper, spell it himself. Um, his AAC device, here's some hope for all you parents out there whose kid doesn't want to use it. It's okay because they can still communicate, but it's a great tool for learning to write a sentence. Mm, okay. Because Gavin can form a three, four, five word sentence on a soccer, and then he can copy it down. And he might not be able to spell every word on his own, but he can find it on a soccer and um, write a sentence down. Um, there, there's just a lot of hope out there of a lot of things he can math. He can math is harder than the reading concepts for him. Um, he can read about hundred sight words. Oh, wow. Uh, write about 25 words on his own. Um, and, but the numbers are harder for him, but he can write to 30 on his own in order. Um, we're working on just randomly being able to write up to hundred, um, I'm a very big advocate of, I want to do skills that are going to help my kid. He sure. doesn't really, like he can add and subtract a little bit, simple ones, but I said he can run a calculator on a phone. So we don't need to teach him how to add. And subtract. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, wow. I don't want it to feel like, cause he's 12. Remember he's 12. Right. Um, and so he, and we've worked really hard for this. I homeschooled him one year with COVID. Um, and I have a teaching degree too. So that helps. But, um, he, we just keep pushing him. He's starting junior high this year. And when we had his IEP it was the best IEP we've ever had. And I was super excited coming out of it because they're not just going to keep him in a special ed room. Like, well, he doesn't belong in there for this or this. And so just keep pushing. Cause you can see what your kid can do and don't stop pushing. It's mm-hmm. exhausting. It is beyond exhausting, but it's worth it because yeah people are finally starting to see that, yeah, my kid can do things like really do things like yeah. that. Oh, I never thought he would be able to do, except we just kept pushing him because we did. And yeah. um, is there anything else? You no, want that's, to no, that's great. That's amazing. I think uh, I would love for you to come and homeschool my children, please. And it, yeah, I, I do probably have wouldn't. When, I do when have to say school. People <laughs> right? Thought, people thought I was crazy. I just wasn't ready to send him back yet because of COVID. Yeah. Um, I thought I was crazy, but it was actually less stressful when I had him homeschooling because I knew exactly what he was doing all day. Yeah. I knew exactly what he was learning. And he was less anxious because he was right next to me. Gosh, that's amazing. I wish but that I, I had that same experience. But what I couldn't give him was a social piece that he needed. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. Courtney or Leah? Well, Julie, I'm curious, does, um, does Gavin have a te- like a focus? Aaron, he just got an AD, or ADHD diagnosis because like his hyperactivity and like lack of focus. Have, do you have that with Gavin or is he able to like sit down and well, attend? Thing. <laughs> if it's something he really likes, like animals, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's way more focused. And I have tried to tell school many times he doesn't care about the pilgrims and Thanksgiving. Give him a nonfiction right. book and let him write about elephants. But he has gotten better with age. I mean, when he was in kindergarten, first, second grade, they had to put him in the corner with partitions because he couldn't even concentrate. Mm-hmm. But and I was I was all for it because I I there was no other no other way he was gonna get any work done. Not like now. He, he waves to everybody who comes there and wants to see it, but yet he can do his work, but he also needs somebody right there mm. on task. Like yeah. if that on said, Gavin, do this workbook page, there is no way he would ever get the thing done. Mm. So he, he needs that guidance of Gavin stay on task. You know, but once he is focused, 
but he also sometimes get hyper focused. Like he loves puzzles, interlocking puzzles, and he will do a 50 piece puzzle and he will not stop until he finishes. Wow. So again, it's an activity he likes. Sure. You know, that he sure. Wants. Sure. That's but it's like anybody, like, I, if you're more interested in something, you're going to be way more focused than something you don't want to do. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. it's no different than us with yeah. focus with things. You know, the one thing that about Angelman syndrome is it is so diverse. And so you have like the four different genotypes and how they all, they all present. And I'm, I'm curious because when you talk about therapeutic treatments and you talk about some of the things that are happening, you know, not all the genotypes are being tested on right now yeah. um, or, you know, being permitted in clinical trials. So for, for you, for a parent perspective, how does, how does that make you feel? So, I mean, of course, with like the lack of research in mutation alone versus deletion, I mean, it is like, I see there's a gap, but I do understand that there's a larger community with um, that's affected by the AS deletion genotype. So it makes sense to me if I step back and look at it from a different perspective versus why not my kids? Yeah, I look yeah. at it as, you know, I have to look at it for everybody, but that's affected with Angel and Syndrome. Sure. And sure. I mean, me doing that, like stepping back and looking at it in that perspective, I do understand it and it makes the most sense to me because in order for them to do the proper research for us, they need to do it for the larger community first. Sure. sure. Well, and I th- yeah, I think that that's a, such a great perspective to have. I'm curious if you could ask one of the researchers to think about like or study or understand more about mutation. What's maybe one of those things that you're really curious to know more about? When So when it comes to that, I think more, I would, I'm just curious as to like, What do they actually understand? What can they learn? And what is it like with sensory? Because I feel like I've noticed so many mutation kids, they really seek sensory input. Yeah. And they do certain actions looking for that sensory input, whether it's like grabbing somebody or pulling somebody's hair, they're looking for that reaction, but they're also looking for the input of that, like that heavy work. And I wonder like, why is that? And also what do they understand and what are like, what are they comprehending? Mm -hmm. Because I can see that my children, they do understand us, you know, certain words and certain statements, but I don't know what all do they understand when me and dad are just sitting here talking at dinner and they're there and we're including them, but do they, you know, where are they? What page are they on? So I mean, mine is just more like neurological. I would love, I always think about when I'm watching Jackson from like afar, I'm like, man, I wish I could just jump in your body for two (laughs) seconds just to understand for a moment, like what you're feeling right now. Right. And just to understand what you are taking in and what you're comprehending and yeah, or uh, why you're feeling this way. Like what's making you so upset right now. And you know, nonverbal, we don't know. Yeah. So it's let's try this, let's try that. And then they get overstimulated. So yeah. So Amanda, was the original question like what we're what they're doing right now that we're excited about or thankful yeah, for? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say some things that Erin and it was I had to like sit and actually it, it's a good question to ask ourselves and we should probably ask ourselves more often versus like the things that are hard. Yeah. Um I, I think just like recently he's started to run to the bathroom when he needs to go to the bathroom like he's literally run in and pooped on the potty which wow I mean, for anybody Amazing. listening that is like yeah. worth a celebration so that's been really exciting um he also has um he loves the pool but he I don't know if y'all have this this trouble but um he can jump up and down but he can't jump forward and so it's been one of the things that we've been working with him on at the pool. And so he's not jumping into the pool, but he's falling into the pool because <laughs> he oh, wants he's up there with yeah. and his friends, you know? And so we're like, okay, that's fun. Like he, he's jumping in. Um, I think his listening skills too have just gotten so good. I can, you know, it's sometimes I'll be like, Hey, Aaron, can you bring me that or whatever? And he'll do it. And it just really kind of, it gets me excited. Um, with OT, he can draw a line and a circle, uh, oh, nice. circles like a yeah. little wonky, but, um, and then the last thing that we worked really hard on with, uh, speech and, um, his other therapists are emotions. Cause Julie, just like you said, it's like, what is most important for him right now? Like, is he in pain? Is he mad? Is he fat? Mm-hmm. Right. And so the other day they said like, he, 
did something and he ran up to the wall where they have the big emojis and he like hit the right one. Um, oh, one of the kids was sad. And so he ran up and hit the sad Aww. emoji. Um, so yeah, there's like little things like yeah. that. Now he's not doing it on the AAC, well, but he could hit an emoji on the wall. So yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's awesome. I love that though. Yeah. Right. Thanks for that question. It was good. Oh <laughs> good yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, I a hundred percent agree with you. I think that I'm often thinking about all the things that I'm not doing good as a parent that I'm failing both Baden and Jackson. And I wish Jackson was doing this or comparing myself to other, other parents. Right. I mean, I even found myself in this podcast recording, like basically saying like, my God, why did, why wasn't I better during COVID? Like, and why did I not move up to where Julie is and just live with her for the full year? Right. I mean, once again, we do this to ourselves, right. And it's just, it's not, it's not healthy for us or for our kids to those expectations. So sometimes it's really good just to think about the good things that are happening specifically with your child and your family. So Leah, what about you? I've, I've had the benefit of time here getting to think about right. um, working and student a lot of success this um this last year I mean he has really taken sign language on and just I think that's one of the the coolest things that I've seen is because when we got his diagnosis you know the little bit we did get when we saw the geneticist was that you know he's not gonna have any fine motor control and um gross motor is going to be hard, physical activities. Um, and he can sign sentences um, and he loves it when you sign back with him and he can have a Aww. full conversation just signing. And I, so I love to sign with him. And anytime I know a word, I will speak and sign so he can learn Aww, it. Um, I love that. My parents just got a Roomba during Amazon prime days and Caden is obsessed with it. And so we taught him the sign for vacuum. And he has been talking about this Roomba since Friday. Um, he thinks it's the coolest thing. And oh my gosh, I love that. Another thing that I just find extraordinary is that, well, I, one, I know he, he's known his name, like he can recognize it, he can read it. And he's been able to do that for a really long time and other people's names. Um, but one of the things that was just really neat over this last year was to see him learn like a three minute dance routine and he knew it. Um, and he, he would practice it at therapy because this, this place that we go to this immersive place, it's 40 hours a week. So he's there. It's like his job to wow. be in therapy. Um, and I was nervous about him going to this recital because I just figured he'd have a lot of anxiety on the stage. And my husband danced with him, which if you know, Bobby, he was oh my like, gosh. this is a thing I never thought I would do, but I will do it because I love my child. Right. Um, so he was up there, but, um, Caden, you know, just with his anxiety, I wasn't sure if he'd be able to get in front of people. So every day at therapy, they would, they had, they created a little stage and every day they'd let him practice his routine in front of his friends and the, the teachers that were there. So that by the time the, the dance rolled around, he was able to do it and he was yeah. happy. He loved it. Um, he love is he just, again, Julie was talking about um, full sentences on the AAC. Caden does that. And I just like, he wants to be understood so badly that he's willing to do anything. Um, and that determination is just more than I think I've ever seen in any other human. He is determined to make you understand him. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I, when hearing Julie talk about how her child can write these words and write, you know, work on his numbers and he can read, um, and, and can concentrate in school. I'm over here thinking about all the cool things that I know my kid can, will be able to do. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, like it, it sure. is something that like, here's, here's the bar. They set it so low when we were at the geneticist's office and he's just blowing past it. And I'm excited. Hi buddy. I'm excited because I've, I've, I've seen that now. I've seen that another parent is saying this is possible and it is what I want for my kiddo too. Yeah. So yeah. I, I want that for him and I'm going to, come hell or high water, <laughs> you know, Right. I'm going to help my child be the best he can be. I want him to achieve the most he can achieve. Um, and so I, that was, that was amazing. Like, thank you, Julie, for sharing that with us, because I have taken a lot of, um, I, I don't even know how to explain it. Just like uh, joy from what you tell me, mm -hmm. it has given me hope 
for my child. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's another thing about this journey is that I am constantly finding hope in places where one, I didn't even know it existed. Mm -hmm. And two, sometimes in like the darkest parts of this journey, Mm -hmm. other people have shared what they're going through or what they've been through and coming out on the other side. And there's so much hope there. Mm -hmm. And so how could I not be excited for my kid's future when I know that these, these kinds of achievements are possible? Absolutely. So I'm curious, you know, I think it's interesting you say that. I mean, at least for Jackson, who's deletion, um, I'm just going to share one thing because I, you know, this weekend it was, it was mommy and Jackson and mommy weekend. And so I took him to a splash pad and for the first time ever, I watched Jackson basically connect with another little boy who was nonverbal as well. And they just chased each other around the splash pad. So everywhere this little boy went, Jackson would go right up to him and they would just look at each other and like kind of scream at each other. But it's like they had their own conversation with each other. And it's the first time I've seen him interact with like kids to where they, then someone interacts back with him. And like, it was, it was the coolest thing ever. And, you know, when you talk about those dark moments, the one thing that I think as a parent that, you know, I'm so fearful of is Jackson not having friendships or not having people around him that he can connect with. And I think that was um, as much as one, I hate being wet and I hate being cold. So I'm never in the pool. I'm never in the hot tub. That is my husband's job. And I love him for doing it, but I was freezing. It was the morning. We needed something to do, but it brought me so much joy in that moment. I'm like, I can sit here freezing my tail off for the rest of my life. If it means I get to watch my child engage in this way. Um, It was beautiful, but I'm curious, two more questions and more so about resources. So when you think about your specific genotype in the past, a lot of work has been done specifically focusing on deletion positive, right? It's the largest population. Um, You know, we know a lot that if there's a deletion, so if we activate the paternal gene, you'll create that like easy peasy. Other genotypes are a little bit more detailed and a little bit more complicated, right? So I'm curious from your perspective, um, what are some of the most pressing gaps in like resources for that you guys see for yourself? Um, And like, how does that make you like, how does that make you feel? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Because I think a lot of times, a lot of like, like the trials that are happening, specific genotypes, um, some of the resources we make, we might make them with the, with the lens of a deletion positive child. So from your perspective, what are some of the gaps of resources or research that you see that think you think that needs to be concentrated on? And you might not have an answer, but I'm curious. Julie, who is just everybody, because you can't see, has just been joined by our special guest. Gavin is on the call with us too. So he's ready to oh. go to bed. I bet. I bet. No, I bet. No, I'll be up. <laughs> Go with daddy. It's okay. We get it. You do. Yeah. You, you do what you have to do. We all understand who's on this call, right? Gavin wants his mom. I totally get it. Um, I can say my piece real yeah, quick about yeah. um, so at the imprinting center defect in the fact that in the fact that we have been on this journey for like, I feel like a a longer time that when we first started this, there, there wasn't, we've always kind of felt on this Island because I'd never really, I mean, every, everybody's kid with angel syndrome is so different. Yeah. I also have never been able to relate exactly to anybody with the same types of needs and progresses that Gavin has just because of his age. I didn't, when we, he was first diagnosed, I didn't really know anybody of his age. Sure. Um, and with the research thing, like I feel the same way of like, well, it's all focused on deletion because that's where the masses are. And yeah. so we're just kind of waiting for our time to shine. And when are they going to start focusing on imprinted center? Yeah. I mean, it's about- not the population, which makes sense that if there's not the population, they're not going to focus on it as much, but yet we still need it as much as the deletion kids. A hundred percent. No, I think it's a completely valid and true point. And that's why I brought it up because 
I think it's kind of the same thing when we talk about or when we, when we hear from the community, like there's no resources for our adults living with Angelman syndrome. Like it's one of those things that we tend to be very reactive or we create resources or, re, or research and when we see that the need is there, right? And so I think it's an important, definitely important message for myself to hear from the foundation perspective, but also remembering that the community is this beautiful tapestry of so many different genotypes, so many different layers of that genotype and so much different diversity within those genotypes. So it's important that we meet the needs of each one of them. But Courtney, Leah, anything to add on that? I can go. Um, I think that uh, for us, well, being told, initially like right off the bat from the geneticist like nobody has this right yeah. <laughs> like yeah you have you have a child with a rare disease and on top of it it's the rarest of the rare it's like less than one percent to have mosaicism which i think dr dew has told me one time it technically falls under icd it is a type of imprinting center defect mm -hmm. um so this the stats around it are weird but um you know to have i, I have basically with everyone i've ever met all the other parents um, in person, they've never met another parent with a mosaic kid. So I'm, and, and when we talk, a lot of times there's big differences between um, things that our kids are doing. Um, and I, I think for me, um, I've sort of resigned myself to the fact that when it comes to trials, clinical trials, we're last, um, <laughs> you know, we are the smallest mm. part of the population. We're last. And, but we also have weird little things to consider. Like yeah. if we activate the paternal, then now we risk having too much, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we have, would have that overexpression. And so we don't want to overexpress, you know, this, this gene and, um, and other genes. And so, uh, there, there's part of me that's like, you know, my kid is just fine the way he is. Mm -hmm. Do I wish he had some other abilities? Absolutely. Do I wish things weren't so hard for him? Yes. Do I wish they weren't hard for me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. selfishly, um, or not. I don't think it's selfish to want things to be easier for yourself. Um, but I think until they can, can definitively say that, we figured it out for mosaic kids. Um, and we know that we're not going to complicate things further. I'm okay to just sit back and watch it happen. I will be the loudest non-deletion parent cheering when that mm -hmm. day comes. Yeah. I will be so happy because it will be a step in the right direction for the rest of us. Um, so I'm just gonna, it, it, what else can I do, but wait and see. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and be excited for you guys when the day comes for you and, and keep praying that that day will also come for us. Yeah. That's a very healthy, um, perspective. And I, I appreciate that very much. It's taken a lot of angst and yeah. tears. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay if that perspective changes in an hour. I get it, yeah. right? I yeah, mean, it's a journey, absolutely. right? Yeah. What about you, Courtney, anything to add? No, I, similar to Leah, you know, with the UPD, we have the same risk of overexpression and mm -hmm. then hearing more about Duke 15Q. I, I, I appreciate the way that the, you know, the process is rolling out so that it's, you know, safe for all. Um I never really felt, I do know of a couple other families who have UPD, but they're not local. Mm. But I think because we were able to connect with some families locally um, that are both deletion positive, but just having other families nearby with Angelman syndrome, yeah. like, I never felt too much like an island or like, right. oh, we have UPD and you have deletion. It just, you know, it's like when we're all together, you know, we all understand the sleep and the, you know, all the, yeah. um, and, and I think going to an Angelman clinic early was really helpful too. just, to we felt very, you know, thankful that we had one. So we're in Nashville, we're in Atlanta, so just a couple hours away. So, mm -hmm. but right now today, I, no, I, I want like more, you know, I want big things like insurance and education to be complete. Right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but besides that, no, I think the, this, the foundation does a lot and Dr. Kiri has been wonderful. 
we've spoken with him about behavior and the clinics are great. So just yeah. what you provide. But yeah, I think that, I mean, I think what is so interesting about this conversation is and when Courtney, you bring it up, like, obviously we don't segment ourselves into the different genotypes. We find people that we connect with within the community and those are kind of our people. And that it is some, you know, most time it just feels good to be in the, in the room with someone who has heard of Angelman. They might even, I even have a kid, but they've heard of it. And that's a win right in my, in my book, right? So I think that there's still a lot that we need to learn about Angelman in all the genotypes. I think there, you know, the research is ever evolving and we're learning more. And when, as these trials are happening, we'll learn more about those and how they will affect. And I think it is important that, you know, people that are listening, especially if they do feel like they're being left out, that um, that the, the research and the work has been happening for all genotypes, but because the genotype is those, those genotypes are a little bit more sensitive and different extra, very careful work needs to be done. Right. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to make this any, like the, this any worse. Right. And so I think it's important, at least from the foundation's perspective for families that are listening, that may have one of the lesser, you know, lesser known genotypes that work is happening every single day to try to figure out how we support all of those living with Angelman, whether it's through a resource, whether it's through a treatment or through, you know, through a clinic and symptomatic treatments, it's all happening as much as possible. And I've taken so much of your guys' time, but I know that this has been such a great conversation um, and is such a great understanding and perspective. So where you guys are coming from and the, the lens that you guys see with the different genotypes within the community. So thank you so much, Julie, Leah, and Courtney. Um, but we're just so thankful for all of you and um, for the work that you, um, you know, you do for the community because all of you have done, you know, are a part of the community and doing things in some ways. So thank you for being on and sharing your journey tonight with me. Thanks, Amanda. Awesome. We are halfway through season two. So hopefully you enjoyed this episode and come back next week for more. Thanks for listening to the ASF podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support us, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating or review. And please don't forget to subscribe.